The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. That's newthinkingaloud.org. You can even order a printed copy from mta-magazine.magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore behavioral memories associated with cases of the reincarnation type. With me is Dr. James Matlock, an anthropologist who is the co-author with Erlander Haraldson of a recent book called I Saw a Light and Came Here, Children's experiences of reincarnation. He also contributes articles to the Psy Encyclopedia, published by the Society for Psychical Research in England. He is, uh, as I mentioned, an anthropologist and the author of dozens of academic papers on reincarnation, parapsychology, anthropology, and related areas. Welcome, Jim. Hi. Thanks, Jeff. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. We've been delving into uh, reincarnation. We're taking, I guess you might say, a deep dive. Uh, we've done three previous interviews now. I want to encourage our viewers to uh, check out. But the theme now are behavioral memories. And that's an interesting uh, topic. Let's define, first of all, for our viewers, what we mean by a behavioral memory. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, behavioral memories um, are behaviors uh, shown by the subject of a reincarnation case, that is, the, a, a child, typically, uh, who uh, recalls a previous life. Uh, that are consistent with the uh, the person whose life he recalls. Yeah. That is, the child behaves in ways like the previous person behaved. Mm -hmm. It reminds me in a way, I know we haven't touched on this yet, but I know you're aware there's a literature in the field of heart and lung transplants where mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a person who receives a transplant from a donor, right. uh, a deceased donor, often acquires the uh, some of the behaviors that were associated with that donor. Owner. Yes, and those are really very interesting cases. Unfortunately, it's it's hard to research them because uh, it, it, because of uh, confidentially uh, confidential issues, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maintained by the hospitals. Hospitals who do these uh, the transplants normally want to keep the donors and the recipients as separate from each yeah. other. So it's only occasionally uh, that uh, that the uh, the donor becomes known, mm -hmm. uh, and then it becomes possible to. Uh, compare uh, certain behaviors of the the recipient is has shown, and some of these are really very bizarre, yeah. you know, behaviors. Uh, one I recall the um, uh, the uh, the recipient started uh, of a of a uh, I think it was a, of a heart or maybe heart lung. Um, I started calling uh, his wife by the name of his donor's wife. Oh, I, I see. Uh, uh, but there, there are other, there are other things that are more, mm -hmm. more strictly behavioral, yeah. um, as well. Uh, yes, and I, those are similar mm -hmm. to what we see in the reincarnation cases. But in the reincarnation cases, we have the added uh, uh, element that uh, that they that the the children are remembering. Uh, a specific previous person with whom they're identifying. Yes. Uh, so in addition to uh, talking about memories that they have of that person, mm -hmm. they're also showing behaviors, demonstrating behaviors. Yeah. And of course, there's no physical connection like a heart-lung transplant. Right. There's not. You know, there's not. 
you know, so it would have to be a, uh, a, a metaphysical, I suppose one would <laughs> yeah. say, uh, connection mm -hmm. uh, to the incarnation. Well, and some of these behaviors include, for example, uh, we referred to this briefly before, xenoglossy, actually mm. speaking in a language that the child had never been exposed to. Right. And those are some of the most interesting mm -hmm. uh, types of behaviors. Uh, we see that uh, with xenoglossy in cases uh, where uh, the previous person spoke a different language or perhaps spoke in a different dialect, mm -hmm. in some way expressed himself differently, herself differently than the subject, the case subject does, yeah. the child who remembers uh, that life. Uh, and when there is a difference in language, mm -hmm. uh, the child subject often will uh, speak in ways, use language in ways, uh, even be able to uh, converse in that language mm -hmm. uh, like the previous person. And uh, also there are talents, like uh, child prodigies ac acquire talents presumably from past lives. Well, and then that's an interesting subject because child prodigies are one of the, should we say, classic ways that reincarnation was thought to manifest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even before Stevenson's work, yeah. people would point to child prodigies and say, oh, this, this has to be evidence of reincarnation. Um, in fact, Stevenson found very little evidence mm -hmm. of child prodigies uh, as such. In other words, in the the child of, prodigies don't tend to remember Past yeah, lives. at least that. Yes, that's all uh -huh. we can say. Yeah. I mean, it may well be that the explanation for child prodigies, musical prodigies, math prodigies, whatever, is the the carryover of of memories or behaviors from mm -hmm. from the previous life. But because the child didn't say anything, uh, we can't be sure. Yeah. You know. Uh, it's, it's pure speculation mm. in that case. But aren't there uh, sometimes uh, examples of other talents? It, well, but uh, there are also is a couple of examples now. I mean, mm -hmm. since Stevenson's day, we do have a couple of examples of uh, of what could be called, you know, prodigies. Mm -hmm. That is, more developed skills. Yes. Uh, uh, and we do have several examples of skills, mm -hmm. short of prodigies. Uh, but, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a, a recent case that uh, the viewers may be familiar with, uh, of a boy who uh, identified himself as Lou Gehrig, mm. uh, reborn, uh, um, was uh, from a very young age, uh, uh, liked to play baseball, wanted to play it all the time, practice all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, eventually was uh, allowed to throw out the first, uh, the first ball in a uh, Los Angeles Dodgers game. Oh. Uh, and... Uh, but he also uh, identified himself as Lou Gehrig mm -hmm. to his mother, and he had memories that were consistent with Lou Gehrig's life. So in his case, it wasn't just the behavioral uh, uh, element that seemed to carry over. He also had the memories. And, 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 there, a, and, and more than behavioral, we're talking, about, I, I presume, a level of talent. Well, yes. You know, and let's see... Uh, uh, a level of talent, yes, you know, but it was uh, the talent uh, was developed, and this mm -hmm. is important, through his continuing practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, he liked to, and it's hard to separate that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, but that's what athletes do. They mm -hmm. practice all the time, you know, yeah. and that's how they become. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in they, my case, I was the, never very athletic to begin with. I never had much motivation to practice. Mm -hmm. I think you need a certain level of talent bef before you uh, get the kind of feedback that encourages you to practice. Well, that's right. Yes. And so you can't say that there was some talent there to begin with, and it mm -hmm. was nurtured and yeah. And uh, through the continuing practice. And Jim Tucker, who is Ian Stevenson's successor at the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. has a case uh, of, a, of a golf prodigy, mm -hmm. uh, very similar uh, to the Christian Help case, uh, of a, uh, a boy who, uh, from a very young age, enjoyed playing golf mm -hmm. and uh, became very good at it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in later childhood, uh, began, you know, winning junior tournaments and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now, short of prodigies, we do see examples of skills, yes. real skills. Mm -hmm. um, and these skills are in some ways almost more interesting because 
they they uh, they emerge sort of full blown, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 they aren't just um, tendencies towards something which is then you know nurtured through practice yeah. until it becomes something. Um, well, the acquisition important. of a full blown skill, I would think, would count as evidence against what we referred to in a, our previous interview as the living agent psi hypothesis, because uh, having a skill is not the same as acquiring information through clairvoyance. No, I, I don't think it is either. Uh, there are philosophers who, however, claim that it might be possible yeah. uh, to do that, but. I don't know. I'm quite skeptical of that argument, frankly. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't see uh, much evidence of it. I mean, that is reaching into what we talked last time about a super psi. Yeah. Uh, we're moving beyond what the, the level of psi that can be demonstrated in mm-hmm. the laboratory to something we have to imagine, yeah. as an imagined capability. Uh, and, and sort of imagine that if that capability is developed in a certain way, then that perhaps would explain this. Mm-hmm. But uh, I just think a simpler explanation, uh, you know, once once we can agree, if that's possible, that reincarnation is a viable explanation mm-hmm. of these cases, it becomes much simpler than to simply accept that uh, that the skills are somehow carried over. Yeah. Well, what are some of these prodigious skills? Yeah, I wanted to give you an example of them. Uh, There was a Brazilian boy uh, who recalled having been his sister. Mm. Uh, And he was a large family, 13 children, I think, as I recall. Uh, And he... um, the sister who had uh, had killed herself, Mm. saying she wanted to be a boy next time... was the only one in the family who had really uh, was really adept at sewing, at operating mm-hmm. a sewing machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, he also was very adept at his sister's sewing machine. The only other member of the family, uh-huh. only other child okay. of the family, who was. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, is one of Stevenson's cases, mm-hmm. one of the cases he investigated. Okay. Uh, and he learned on on one occasion the uh, when. Uh, a family servant was trying to was having trouble threading the machine. He was, you know, less than four, I think, at the time. Mm-hmm. Pushed her out of the way and showed her how to thread <laughs> the machine, and you know, so uh, you know, when you see something like that, like a fully developed skill yeah. uh, emerging that way in a very young child mm-hmm. uh, who's had no really no training. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I, he never. Uh, uh, he didn't want training. He, mm. he said he already knew how to sew. Uh-huh. He already knew how to operate the machine. And he showed that he did. I mm-hmm. mean, he would finish some of his older sister's uh, uh, work. You I know. see. And so, are there other such examples? Um, I think the uh, there, there's, a, there's a clinket example mm-hmm. of a boy who uh, was very... Uh, uh, adept at, uh, at uh, boat motors. Now, Clinkett is a Northwest Indian tribe. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. Alaskan. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the person he recalled had, uh, had liked to be on the water. He'd been a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he also had been very good at boat motors. <clears throat> and this young kid uh, was remarkably uh, adept at it. In fact, when his father was having trouble with a motor once, he stepped in and, <laughs> and uh, took <laughs> okay. care of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I gather, though, that the predominant uh, behavioral memory that comes up in these cases would tend to be a phobia. I think that's fair to say, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see phobias especially when death was violent. That is, the previous person died violently. Uh, I, the child will show some phobias uh, that are that are consistent with that. Mm-hmm. Um uh, they can be quite extreme sometimes. In fact, Erlinda Harrelson, my co-author of, of the book you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, likens it to post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the children, it's as if the children are, are demonstrating the sorts of reactions that you would expect them had they lived rather than died. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so the phobia so, is related to the specific cause of, of death, death of correct. the previous person. That's right, and it can be generalized also. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a um, uh, an Indian boy who uh, had. His, I'm sorry. These a lot of these cases are kind of uh, if not grotesque. They're they're really 
uh, had a a throat slit. Oh. Okay. Uh, the boy uh, was born with a linear birthmark across his throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the perpetrators of the crime happened to be distant members of the of the family, and by uh, uh, killing him, uh, one of them hoped to clear the way for an inheritance because mm. the boy otherwise would have mm-hmm. inherited this. So he w- and he happened to be a barber. Mm. Okay, and the boy. Besides recognizing this man, was afraid of all barbers and washermen. Oh. Uh, was, he had, uh, washermen had been uh, th- th- his the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cohort. The cohort, yes, really? uh, there the two of them together, and so he generalized his fear, and he was also afraid of the place mm-hmm. that he'd been killed. Mm-hmm. So these phobias, they relate. Yeah. They can relate to articles also. Mm-hmm. I think he was afraid of knives as well. He was afraid to articles, to places, to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I seem to recall a case of uh, which the previous person had been uh, bitten by a poisonous snake, and mm-hmm. the uh, young child had a, a phobia of snakes. Of snakes, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's the sort of thing that we see, uh, and uh, in in cases where uh, where they died in traffic accidents, they're afraid of uh, of. Motor vehicles, things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, another type of behavioral memory would be signs of affection toward Mm -hmm. uh, previous, uh, the family members of the previous person. That's right. You know, and that's, uh, so as I said, the children identify with Mm -hmm. the person. I mean, it's not simply that they describe memories of that person. They really identify with them. Mm -hmm. Use first person in describing these memories. I, you know, did Mm -hmm. this. I did that. Um, and uh, along with that, uh, they will uh, they carry the emotional memories that mm-hmm. are appropriate to that person, so that when they uh, when they encounter uh, the people from the previous life, and see this is a remarkable feature of many of these cases, that uh, it has been possible that uh, to to take what the children say. Uh, they give enough information, mm-hmm. names of places of people to actually track down the previous person. Yeah. Uh, and then when, they, and then when they meet the previous family, uh, the mm-hmm. person, of course, the person's died. Yeah. But when we meet that person's family, they behave towards the people in that family as I- mm-hmm. like the I seem to recall uh, one instance in, in which the young child uh, met the f- husband of the previous uh, person and and behave toward him in a very flirtatious manner like a wife <laughs> right. sat on his lap hugged him yeah when she was a yeah a girl yeah mm-hmm. right a girl subject right yeah. and it can happen the other way too boys mm-hmm. you know uh Stevenson has a case where uh the previous person hadn't had not gotten along with his wife mm-hmm. and the chill the child did not, you know, showed a distant, you know, uh-huh. uh, distance from mm-hmm. uh, from the previous person's wife. So, th- so this shows that there's a lot of continuity. Then exactly, yeah, you know, and they it, it, so it's not just the, the memories that are being recalled, mm-hmm. and so there may be alternative ways to explain that, maybe through ESP, super ESP, or something. Uh, uh, but there's also this behavioral identification, which is mm-hmm. so hugely important, and. Uh, it, it, uh, it, um, I might mention that uh, when Stevenson first started investigating these cases in 1960, first went to India, he wasn't prepared for this, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, because the accounts that he had read before that Mm -hmm. uh, uh, talked mainly about the memories. And he had not expected to find these sorts of behavioral uh, demonstrations as well. And he came to think that they're probably more important, and I agree with them. They mm-hmm. probably more are more important than simply the memories, mm-hmm. uh, because it's so much harder to explain them. And yet, they're consistent with the memories. Mm-hmm. They're entirely consistent with them. Well, are are there memories or behavioral patterns associated with uh, uh, gender identity? Yes, mm-hmm. uh, and this is something else that's very interesting, and also makes a lot of sense. Uh, when there are differences of sex, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the uh, the children who are called a member, being a member of the opposite sex, will behave like that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll cross boy, they'll cross dress. Yeah. Um, uh, they'll call themselves. They'll say, "I'm not a 
you know, I'm not a boy. It's a boy. I'm actually a girl. Or a girl will say, I'm actually, I'm a, really a boy. I am, uh -huh. you know, using the present tense as well yeah. as the first person. Um, so they really fully identify with mm -hmm. the previous people. So in, in these cases, the child, uh, it seems that they identify more with the previous person than with their present life. Yes. Yeah. It, it is very interesting. And it's true. Now, we're talking about very young children here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, in these cases, it may begin it, even before the second year, mm -hmm. but more typically in the second or third year. And the behaviors may show up before the children start to talk mm -hmm. about the previous life. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, uh, we're talking about very young children, yeah. and uh, as the children grow, uh, the behaviors may lessen, may, may dim. The, their memories often do fade as well. Mm -hmm. The behavioral memories may last longer, a little bit longer, but they often do fade also. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find uh, like a, a desire for vengeance if, if uh, someone oh, yes. was murdered in a previous oh, life, yes. they, they want to retaliate? Right. This is very common. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and there have been um, there have been cases where uh, the the child or the ch child's parents and this, uh, sometimes wanted to uh, to prosecute uh, oh. the the the, uh, the felons, you uh -huh. know. But the courts, yeah. it, it, uh, even in Asia, the courts won't allow that. Perhaps mm -hmm. not so far anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I I do know of a, it's sort of a related case, maybe more me, uh, mediumistic, where a, a medium went into trance and began producing mm. uh, literary works in the style right. of and attributed to a deceased person, and right. the widow of of that author sued because she said, mm. "I I'm entitled to the copyright, yeah, not this young not child." This person. Yeah, uh, and it, it is interesting that mediumistic cases we see sometimes. I mean, in mm. not in, with uh, with, with trans mediums yeah. and with mediumistic possession, we sometimes do see the mediums take on these sorts of behaviors. Um, again, that's one of the consistencies between the reincarnation cases and the mediumistic cases. Yeah, the classic case uh, that I'm thinking of is uh, uh, known as the chess game from the dead, mm -hmm. in, in which a medium actually uh, played a game of chess against uh, Victor Korknoy, a grand master of chess. Right. And uh, pl played a very uh, credible game. And not only that, played in an old style. Yes. And played in the old style appropriate to the chess master that he claimed to have been. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the the behavioral, well, I guess you could have to say, behavioral memories seem to occur in the survival literature as as well as the reincarnation literature. Uh, yeah, the survival, the mediumistic survival literature, and we also see it with apparitions. Uh -huh. Yes, you know, and again, uh, a bit of evidence showing how uh, all of these areas uh, of survival mm -hmm. uh, evidence all, all fit together. They yeah. fit together quite nicely. There's nothing mm -hmm. inconsistent. In well, that. since we're talking about uh, mediumistic uh, communications. Maybe I'm jumping around a little bit now, but I do know in an earlier interview, you mentioned the fact that in Asia, the intermission between lifetimes is relatively short, might mm. be you know, 14, uh, 16, where you're going. 18 months, whereas in the Western uh, cases that mm. we have, it can be many years. Yes. And uh, it did occur to me that uh, I, we're off topic, but I want to pursue this thought for a moment. That the the reason for that might well be that in Western culture we are more used to thinking in terms of uh, survival without reincarnation. So, if if I'm if I've just died and I'm in some sort of uh, another world. My expectation may be not that I'm going to reincarnate immediately, but that I'm going to spend some time here. Yes, and uh, and we also have the expectation in the West that we're, our loved ones will meet us when we die. Yeah, uh, you know, and we may die some years after they did. Mm -hmm. So that's also incentive then on the part of the deceased to hang around a little bit longer, mm -hmm. and that may indeed help explain uh, the intermission length. Now, one thing that's interesting is that it's known from the mediumistic literature that even the best communicators stop communicating after a few decades. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely the time that we then see, you know, in the reincarnation cases, that mm -hmm. it matches the yeah. the interval. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does seem like in the West that perhaps we can explain the longer median intermissions, the longer, you know, mm -hmm. typical intermissions, 
uh, I, you know, uh, on that basis, yeah. uh, you know, that uh, people are taking longer to reincarnate in order to appear uh, to their loved ones when they when they die, mm -hmm. uh, and in order to communicate through mediums. So t t the lesson that I get from uh, this is that uh, first of all, it's uh, survival as it's thought about in conventional Christian or Western terms is not necessarily inconsistent with reincarnation. You can. No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. It's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we can have, uh, uh, now, uh, I think resurrection is, uh, <laughs> the, the idea that, uh, but perhaps not. I mean, perhaps you could have uh, several lives and then, uh, you know, there can be, uh, a, a, a bodily resurrection at the end of it. But, uh, you know, it, uh, at least, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, there can be a period of survival, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and stay in the afterlife before, before reincarnation. And, and the other lesson I get from this is that, uh, these things are largely psychologically driven. That yes. what people believe, uh, is likely to uh, shape what actually, yeah, uh, what one might say the progress of the soul is shaped by the beliefs of the soul. Yes, and I think that's a very, another very important insight. Um, I think that uh, that uh, that uh, beliefs, expectations before we die probably have a lot to do uh, with what happens uh, after we die, and that makes sense. I mean, mm -hmm. if consciousness does continue, if the spirit of the mind continues, then it would be perfectly natural, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for it to maintain its personality, return its belief systems, maintain its convictions into death, mm -hmm. and if if there is, uh, if there's a continuing agency after death, mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, uh, if a spirit is able to, uh, uh, it, you know, if it doesn't just continue, uh, if, uh, the mind continues in some sort of control, if its cognitive processes continue, uh, and it's able to make decisions after death, then it would be perfectly natural then for it to act in accordance with the personality and the beliefs mm -hmm. that it had before it died. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in addition to the uh, memories and the behavioral memories, we're, we're going to do a future interview on the physical uh, concomitants of, of reincarnation. That really yeah, helps, I, I think, establish a very strong case uh, for the idea, not only the idea of reincarnation, but it gives us some insights as to uh, possible, I don't want to say mechanisms, because I don't think it's well, mechanistic, but I... Right, you know, it, mechanisms in the, in the, in the, in a general sense, in a broad sense yeah. of, of, uh, of processes. Processes maybe that's is probably a, a better way to put it. Yeah. Uh, and the, the physical things, Particularly bring up the importance of understanding the process, yeah. uh, because uh, physical things aren't they associated with the body? <laughs> and it, it doesn't the body die and end? Mm -hmm. So how can physical processes, how can physical traits mm -hmm. be carried over? Yes, we'll get into that. that that's a, a very interesting topic. It certainly suggests that there's some sort of a an organizing field, one mm -hmm. might say, that mm -hmm. that's uh, one way of looking passes at it. from lifetime to lifetime. Uh, anyhow, that will be the topic of a future interview, so I encourage our viewers to check the listings for <laughs> both our uh, previous interviews and, and the ones that we intend to do uh, while you're here in Las Vegas. Well, wonderful. Okay. One thing I want to mention before before we close, you started off uh, 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 mentioning that uh, that besides my publications that I was writing mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the uh, science for publications that I was writing for the science encyclopedia, which is online, mm -hmm. and I had one of my articles for that science encyclopedia is on behavioral memories, mm -hmm. and so we can encourage our viewers to to go to that yeah. uh, because I describe several cases and it can it can mm -hmm. help uh, illustrate what I've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, and I I am, would hope that they can look up the articles by the author and uh, so that they can see they can your see other, my others my yeah. other articles for the encyclopedia. That would be too. very useful for people who are really interested in digging into this and, and going further than yeah. uh, than what we're able than to just bring the video. out here in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim Matlock, once again, thank you for being with me. And thanks so much, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. And thank you as well for being with us.